Good morning, and welcome to the Johnson Controls third quarter 2024 earnings conference call. All participants will be in listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star than one on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, please press star than two. Please note, today's event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Jim Lucas, Vice President, Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Good morning, and thank you for joining our conference call to discuss Johnson Controls fiscal third quarter 2024 results. The press release and related tables that were issued earlier this morning, as well as the conference call slide presentation, can be found on the Investor Relations portion of our website at johnsoncontrols.com. Joining me on the call today are Johnson Controls Chairman and Chief Executive Officer George Oliver and Chief Financial Officer Mark Van Diepenbeek. Before we begin, let me remind you that during our presentation today, we will make forward-looking statements. Actual results may differ materially from those indicated by forward-looking statements due to a variety of risks and uncertainties. Please refer to our SEC filings for a detailed discussion of these risks and uncertainties, in addition to the inherent limitations of such forward-looking statements. We will also reference certain non-GAAP measures. Reconciliations of these non-GAAP measures to the most directly comparable GAAP measures are contained in the schedules attached to our press release and in the appendix to this presentation, both of which can be found on the Investor Relations section of Johnson Controls' website. I will now turn the call over to George. Thanks, Jim, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on the call today. Let's begin with slide three. We were very pleased to deliver fiscal third quarter results that exceeded almost all of our targets. Organic sales growth was 3%, which was in line with our guidance of low single digits. We delivered a robust 150 basis points of segment margin expansion to 17.9%, which exceeded our guidance of 17%. We are also proud of our free cash flow generation during the quarter, which was more than $500 million higher than the comparable period one year ago. Service led the way once again with 9% growth, which continues to validate our transformation efforts it is encouraging as we continue to build momentum toward meeting our full year financial objectives. Orders grew 5% during the quarter. We expect some quarterly fluctuation in our order of patent given the strong demand for our data center solutions. With the investments we have made over the last few years in technologies for data centers, the launch of a dedicated organization and our one of a kind offerings we remain well positioned in this fast growing segment with solutions that are clearly resonating with customers. We have built a leading position in data centers in North America due to a unique and compelling customer value proposition. As our customers expand internationally to meet the rapidly growing demand for data centers, we grow alongside them as they choose to partner with Johnson Controls around the world. Our backlog grew 10% in the quarter as we continue to see demand for our solutions, both systems and services. The growth in orders and backlog give us increased confidence in our ability to continue delivering sustainable long-term growth. As part of our ongoing business transformation, we announced two divestitures, our residential and light commercial HVAC business and our ear distribution technologies business. These two transactions represent roughly 20% of current sales. At the same time as our earnings results, we announced this morning that I informed the board it is time to initiate our CEO succession plan. Following recent significant milestones in our portfolio transformation, and as we move to the next phase of growth, I believe that now is the right time to begin the process of identifying the next leader of the new Johnson Controls. Accordingly, the board has engaged a nationally recognized search firm and begun a comprehensive search for the company's next CEO. Once my successor has been named, I will remain chair of the board to help facilitate a smooth transition. I am confident in our position as Johnson Controls enters its next chapter, and I remain committed to supporting the full team as we work to ensure Johnson Controls realizes its full potential. Along with the initiation of the company's succession plan, we also announced that as part of our ongoing board refreshment efforts and following a constructive dialogue with Elliott Management, Patrick Decker has been appointed to our company's board of directors, effective immediately. 
Patrick brings experience to our board and having led a transformation of his prior company and his appointment reflects our commitment to continuously refreshing our board to ensure the skills and experiences of our directors appropriately reflect our ongoing transformation. Lastly, before moving to the next slide, we are tightening our full year adjusted EPS guidance to a range of $3.66 to $3.69 from a range of $3.60 to $3.75. Mark will give additional details later in the call. We have made tremendous progress on our business transformation into a simpler, higher growth company positioned to deliver more consistent, predictable results. Turning to slide four, we have made good progress on simplifying our portfolio. Most recently on July 23rd, we reached an agreement to sell our residential and light commercial HVAC business to the Bosch Group in an all cash transaction. The transaction includes 100% of our North America ducted business and our 60% interest in our global residential joint venture with Hitachi. The total transaction is valued at approximately $8.1 billion, which results in approximately $6.7 billion of consideration to Johnson Controls. We are expecting net proceeds of approximately $5 billion after tax and transaction expenses, the majority of which will be used to accelerate returning capital to shareholders and also address leverage. The residential and light commercial HVAC transaction is expected to close in approximately 12 months subject to required regulatory approvals and other customary closing conditions. We expect to report the operating results of the business in discontinued operations beginning in the fiscal fourth quarter of 2024. In addition, on June 18th, we agreed to sell our air distribution technologies business to TrueLink Capital. The sale of air distribution technologies is also an important step in simplifying our manufacturing footprint with the elimination of nearly 30% of our manufacturing facilities. Taken together, these two transactions represent significant milestones in our portfolio transformation. We are now even better positioned going forward as a pure play provider of comprehensive solutions for commercial buildings. Our efforts are turning into results and the value of our transformation is coming into focus. Slide five presents a pro forma look at the new Johnson Controls, representing the composition of our company going forward. Following completion of the two divestitures described earlier, we will be a simpler, higher growth company focused almost exclusively on our engineered solutions offerings. These solutions include commercial HVAC, fire, controls, security, and services, forming the smart building trifecta of energy efficient equipment, clean electrification, and digitalization. The benefits of our transform portfolio include an enhanced margin profile, less complexity, and a more focused operating model. In addition, these divestitures further increase our exposure to the fast growing data center vertical to nearly 10% of sales from 7% as of fiscal year 2023. We expect this percentage to further increase over time given the robust demand we are seeing in this key vertical. While we will continue to look at opportunities to further enhance the portfolio, we believe that the largest elements of the portfolio transformation are now complete. Turning to slide six to discuss our focused business model and how we plan to deliver more consistent, predictable outcomes for our customers and maximize value for shareholders over the life cycle of buildings. Johnson Controls has a unique value proposition for our customers that directly translates to shareholder value creation. Our ability to serve our customers over the life cycle of the building allows us to deliver safe, healthy, and sustainable buildings. As a simpler and more streamlined company, we are now better positioned to leverage our integrated domain expertise, coupled with our extensive branch network to significantly expand margins. Our journey with the customer provides system and service solutions that maximize the opportunities around the life cycle of the asset, delivering outcomes to the customer that save energy, reduce emissions, and optimize building life cycle costs, all while improving the overall occupant experience. 
Most importantly, our ability to drive direct outcomes ensures that we have long-term customers that use several of our services, which creates a compounded impact for the customer and for our shareholders. In fact, a dollar of systems revenue has the potential to generate up to 10 times the revenue over the life cycle of the solution. It all starts with our local teams supported by our centralized engineering teams to provide operational excellence throughout the construction of the new building, starting with the product and technology development through the installation of the new systems. This grows the installed base. Throughout system deployment, our teams are building customer intimacy and confidence in our team to ensure we are creating linkage with our service offering. We have redoubled our focus to build this initial relationship and greatly improved our operational execution over the past few years to drive an enhanced margin profile and grow service. Simply put, service and maintenance delivers recurring revenue for us, and this provides resilient revenue throughout economic cycles. Moving to parts and repairs, our service organization is digitally enabled and unlocks additional value by collecting data from the connected equipment within the building. Leveraging this data lets us detect issues before they occur, leading to reduced downtime and cost savings for the customer. The last part of the cycle is the building retrofit, including the modernization and technology refresh of existing systems. We work closely with the building owner to discuss life cycle planning and the prioritization of the building needs. We have found this to be the perfect opportunity for Johnson Controls to sell additional domains. By compounding the effects of this cycle, we are able to deliver solutions to our customers, leading to significant margin expansion. The ongoing transformation of our portfolio into a quality pure play provider of comprehensive solutions for commercial buildings means that we can service these buildings to deliver outcomes that matter. Accordingly, we are extending our journey with our customers while capitalizing on attractive opportunities in the market. Together, this delivers value across our stakeholder base for customers, employees, and for our shareholders. With that, I'll turn it over to Mark. Thanks, George, and good morning, everyone. Let me start with a summary on slide seven. Total revenue of $7.2 billion grew 3% organically as strong high single-digit service growth more than offset continued weakness in China's system business. Segment margin expanded a robust 150 basis points to 17.9% as we delivered another strong quarter of productivity and converted a higher margin backlog. Adjusted EBS of $1.14 was up 11% year over year and exceeded the high end of our guidance range by four cents. Operations contributed 18 cents of the growth in the quarter as improved productivity and the conversion of higher margin backlog more than offset higher corporate costs related to additional IT investment, cybersecurity enhancement costs, and increased centralization of functional costs. Below the line, we saw favorability from a lower share count. As we continue to build a more consistent and predictable business, we are pleased with the strong adjusted EPS performance in the quarter. On the balance sheet, we ended up the third quarter with approximately 900 million in available cash and net debt decreased to 2.3 times, which is within our long-term target range of two to two and a half times. Year to date, adjusted free cash flow improved approximately $700 million year over year to $1.3 billion. We remain on the path to driving higher free cash flow conversion more consistently. Let's now discuss our segment result in more details on slide eight through 10. Beginning on slide eight, organic sales in our global product business grew 3% year over year, with price offsetting a modest volume decline. Commercial HVAC remained a bright spot for the business, growing mid single digit against a tough comp of mid-teens growth a year ago. Fire and security declined low single digit as a decline in fire suppression more than offset growth in fire detection and security video surveillance. Industrial refrigeration grew approximately 20% with strong double digit growth in both North America and EMILA. Overall, global residential grew mid single digits in the quarter. 
Global ductless residential grew low single digit, a strong double digit growth in APAC, more than offset continued declines in Europe. In conjunction with improvement in North America residential market, our global ducted residential business grew 10% with strong double digit growth in both North America and EMILA. Adjusted segment EBITDA margin expanded 240 basis points to 24.5% as positive price cost and improved productivity more than offset mixed headwinds from ongoing weakness in China. Now moving to slide nine to discuss our building solutions performance. Order momentum remained healthy with 5% growth in the quarter. Overall, service order grew 12% with a broad-based growth across the region. Systems order grew 2% at North America offset decline in APAC. Organic sales increased 4% in the quarter, led by service growth of 9%. Systems revenue grew 1% as decline in APAC, more than offset growth in North America and EMILA. Building really, solution backlog continues to remain at record levels, growing 10% to $12.9 billion. Service backlog grew 7% and system backlog grew 10% year over year. Let's discuss the building solutions performance by region on slide 10. Orders in North America increased 5% in the quarter with mid single digit growth in both systems and services. As a reminder, our quarterly order growth can fluctuate based on the timing of certain large projects, particularly in the data center vertical. We remain confident in our competitive positioning in the data center and our pipeline remains quite robust. Sales in North America were up 8% organically with continued strength across HVAC and controls up over 20% year over year. Overall, our system business grew 9% while service grew 6%. Segment margin expanded 150 basis points year over year to 15.9% driven by the continued execution of higher margin backlog, improved productivity, and solid service contribution. Total backlog ended the quarter at 9 billion, up 14% year over year. In EMILA, orders were up 11%, with over 25% growth in service. Systems orders were flat as we continue to remain focused on driving higher quality growth with higher margin and improved cash flow conversion. Across the portfolio, we saw strong double-digit growth in controls, fire, and security. Sales in EMILA grew 8% organically, with broad-based growth across the portfolio. Momentum continues to build within our service business, up 15% year over year, driven by strong double-digit growth from both our recurring and shorter cycle transactional businesses. Our system business grew low single digits led by strength in controls. Segment EBITDA margin expanded 170 basis points to 10.3%, driven by the positive mix from the growth in service and the conversion of higher margin system backlog. We've made tremendous progress in improving the profitability in EMILA, as well as the mix of higher margin service. A more disciplined funnel in systems gives us further confidence in continued momentum in margin improvement. Backlog was up 12% year over year, to $2.5 billion. In Asia Pacific, orders declined 2% as we have focused on deploying resources to the most attractive part of the market and remain selective on the jobs we quote and ultimately book. Given our strong install base in the region and our continued focus, we saw high single digit growth in service. Sales in Asia Pacific declined 19% as the systems business continued to be impacted by ongoing weaknesses in China. Our service business grew 8% in the quarter with strong double digit growth in our recurring revenue contracts. Segment EBITDA margin declined 220 basis points to 11.7% as weakness in China offset positive mix from our service business. Backlog of 1.4 billion declined 12% year over year. Now let's discuss our fourth quarter and fiscal year 2024 guidance on slide 11. We enter the fourth quarter with solid momentum, led by our resilient service business and continued demand in our North America system business. Our margin-rich backlog remains at a historical level, and our global products book to build business have stabilized and returned to growth. We are introducing fourth quarter sales guidance of approximately 7% growth, as strong demand in North America and EMILA 
is somewhat muted by one more quarter of slower recovery in the system business in China. Global products momentum is expected to continue as our book to bill orders remain positive throughout the third quarter and the tough comparison in China abates. For the fourth quarter, we expand segment EBITDA margin to be approximately 19% and adjusted EPS to be in the range of $1.23 to $1.26. For the full year, we are tightening adjusted EPS guidance to a range of $3.66 and $3.69. We now expect organic sales to grow approximately 3% and segment EBITDA margins to expand approximately 110 basis points. Our working capital metrics continue to improve, and our free cash flow performance here to date has been strong. We continue to invest capital in attractive areas, including data center manufacturing expansion and ongoing ERP consolidation. While this will be a slight headwind, we expect adjusted free cash flow conversion of approximately 85% or better for the full year. With our recent announced planned divestiture, I want to highlight some financial details and future reporting on slide 12. As George mentioned at the beginning of the call, we were extremely pleased with our announced sale of the residential and light commercial HVAC business. This came just a few weeks after we announced our intent to sell air distribution technologies business. Together, these two transactions represent hopefully 20% of the sale and the majority of the portfolio we had previously highlighted as non-core. We expect to report the residential and light commercial business as discontinued operation with our fiscal fourth quarter results and will provide our official fiscal year 2025 guidance on a continuing operation basis. While the two transactions would be dilutive to EPS prior to any cost offset, we have actions in place to address the stranded cost, and we are working on accelerating some of these actions prior to closing. Through the combination of share repurchase, debt pay down, and restructuring, we have a plan in place to fully offset the stranded costs. We will provide more details when we report our fiscal fourth quarter results. Before we open up the lines for questions, I want to conclude with a summary of our recent transformation on slide 13. We have spent the last few years transforming the company into a comprehensive solution provider for commercial buildings, and this continues to be a differentiator for Johnson Controls. We took a major step in simplifying the portfolio with our two recently announced divestiture, and we believe our one operating model will enable us to deliver more consistent predictable results. We operate in many attractive markets, which allows us to build our backlog with margin-rich jobs that have a service still throughout the life cycle of building. Our systems backlog, coupled with our resilient service business, positions us for sustainable and continued margin expansion. As our margins continue to improve, coupled with our commitment to discipline capital allocation, we would expect double-digit EPS growth. As George mentioned earlier, the result of our portfolio transformation is now a faster growing, more profitable, less complex, and more operationally focused Johnson Controls, and we are excited for the next chapter. With that, operator, please open the lines for questions. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star than one on your telephone keypad. If you are using a speakerphone, we ask that you please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. In respect of time, we ask that you limit yourself to one question and one follow-up question. Today's first question <laughs> comes from Scott Davis at Melius Research. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, uh, George and, and Mark and Jim, and congrats, George, on the uh, announcement. Thanks, Scott. Morning, Scott. Um, I wanted just to uh, dig in on the data center kind of impact on uh, backlog a bit. It, I would assume that a big chunk of that backlog growth is data center, but um, maybe you could give us some color on uh, on, on the impact and materiality of, uh, of that growth in that vertical. Thanks. Yeah, let me give you a framework, and then Mark can talk a little bit more about the, um, you know, the how it's being built in backlog and converting, you know, we're already now, we, we said in the prepared remarks that we're about 7% a year ago. Um, when we look at the, at the business today, it's about 10% of sales on a pro forma basis. Uh, continues to be very strong. 
Uh, we're working across all of the hyperscalers, colos. Uh, we've got a global team now making sure that with our leadership technology and all of our domains that we're positioned now to be able to provide the best solutions globally. So that pipeline's continuing to build. Um, and, and I think as we, as we think about our orders and backlogs, certainly this is gonna be a higher mix uh, of backlog playing out. In many cases, it, it is multi-year uh, backlog. And for us, we look at the next 12 months you know, as far as how we, we book the backlog. And then as we think about the growth, Scott, going forward, this is going to be strong double-digit growth um, in 24. It's going to be, for this year, strong double digits and, and continuing to accelerate over the next few years, given the, the work that we're doing. You know, Mark, you want to talk about the mix a little bit? Yeah, so, uh, Scott, if you look at that uh, growth in backlog of 10%, uh, almost $13 billion in backlog, the, the mix remains consistent uh, year over year. Uh, because a lot of those data centers, as George mentioned, uh, are multi-year. Um, there is clearly more data center work in that $12.9 billion, but, but that mix will continue to evolve more towards the, the data center as we churn that backlog. We will maintain our definition of backlog as what we see in revenue for the next 12 months. And with that consistency, you'll see a change over time, more tilted towards the higher growing uh, segments of the market. Okay, that's helpful. And guys, I'm just looking at this uh, slide six and the 10, uh, 10 to 1 uh, numbers on, on service and digital versus the uh, OE side. Uh, I, I don't remember seeing that before. Maybe, maybe you've put it up and I just have missed it. But um, is this kind of a theoretical number or you actually have expectation that, um, that these are achievable type uh, ratios uh, going forward? So the algorithm that we've been working uh, for multi years now as we've been building the service business depends on, you know, starts with the install base, Scott, relative to not only what we're putting into the install base, but going after the existing install base. When we can right out of the gate get connectivity and, and ultimately that first level service, and then now uh, with, with open blue and with connectivity with the use of data, <clears throat> there's significant value propositions that we add we add on to the what would be historic historical maintenance and break fix. And so as we now are seeing that over the last couple of years, we're getting to that level of multiple relative to what we see on a run rate basis that over the life cycle can achieve that level of revenue. So that is real data with customers that we've had connectivity, we've had install based connectivity, we're using data and we're now adding on additional services. Um, that is absolutely real. And, and, and that revenue multiplier um, evolves based on market vertical and, and product lines. So, 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 and we've tried to lay that out on that chart. HVAC is, is a multiplier that, that, that's a, a little lower than 10 turn, while you go to security controls and then fire provides um, the, the higher level of, of multiplier over the life cycle of the product. So depending on the market vertical, depending on the product, that multiplier expense. But this is um, real experience uh, data that we've looked through uh, uh, over the past few years, and, and we believe we can continue to deliver that through that operating model we've now implemented. I think important, it's important, Scott, that we're, it's really tied to outcomes versus just the traditional buy the drink type service. And so as we're now converting the, not only the, the technology and the product, but with our open blue and, and data, that that really changes the game. And then from a attrition standpoint, it significantly reduces the attrition, which continues to build our base uh, going forward for service going forward. Thank you. And our next question today comes from Julian Mitchell at Barclays. Please go ahead. Thanks, uh, good morning, and um, congrats, uh, George, on a very good run. Um, in terms of, um, you know, I suppose just first off, um, wanted to start with the, um, the the overall kind of top line growth outlook and, and sort of two two elements of that. I think one is the total company this year is growing about 3%. Um, you know, when we look at the sort of the, the go forward business, the, the 22 billion revenue base or so, is that sort of 3% rate um abnormal in in any respects when you're looking at, at the backlog and assuming no big changes in interest rates or, or U.S. policy kind of as we're looking ahead. And related to that, the fire and security business is something that 
you've known for for a long time. Um, it looks like sales are flat there this year, and that will be about 45% of the the go forward revenue. I think. Um, what what do you think foreign security can grow at sort of medium term? Oh, great great question. So so let's start first with with the three percent for the full year. Um, really, we had a, a lot of cyber headwind in the first quarter that have muted somewhat um, um, that overall growth rate year on year. So I, I'll tell you for a, a longer term algorithm, 3% is absolutely what, uh, uh, absolutely not what our expectation would be. It'd be closer to, to mid single digits. And that's really on the basis of a mid to high single digit growth in our service business and, and a mid single digit growth uh, into our systems business overall. Um, and so those fundamental driving uh, a, a better mix overall are different um, depending on the different um, product line. And, and right now, HVAC is benefiting from a lot of tailwind coming from decarbonization data center and, and other market verticals that have really propped up the growth there. And, and you're right, we've seen a little bit of softness overall in the market on fire and security this year. Um, we're seeing, uh, 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 particularly in our book and build business, uh, some sign of recovery, and we think we can maintain that mean single digit growth over time for that business uh, as the uh, service and recurring component aspect of that business will continue to be higher than that mean single digit target. Thank you. And our next question today comes from Nigel Coe at Wolf Research. Please go ahead. <clears throat> Thanks. Good morning. And uh, George, you had one hell of a career, so uh, congratulations and, uh, and good luck with your next steps. Um, yeah. So just on that topic, um, do you have a, a time frame in mind for the uh, for the succession? I, I, I know you obviously want to find the right person to do a very, very for, you know, thorough search, but uh, any any timeline? And then maybe just touch on um, you know Patrick's appointment to the board. Uh, obviously, you know Patrick very well. Um, you know what, what sort of uh, skills uh, you know kind of made him the right person for the for the board, and and I wonder if maybe he's under consideration for the next CEO. Well, the, the timing of this, I, I mean, we've made great progress on our portfolio with the moves we recently made. Um, I think it's clear we have a lot of confidence now in the strategy playing out. Um, and we're starting to see that the, the results from that, and we've also put a strong leadership and team. Um, and I'm very confident of their capabilities and, and the work that they're doing that's going to position the company to, to continue to be successful. Now, the board, you know, working with the board, we've had succession plans uh, that we've been building uh, over time. So that's well underway. And, and uh, we're looking at both internal and external candidates. You know, the, the board is, is engaged um, directly with a national recognized search firm and, and making sure we're also, you know, looking and, and developing at our internal candidates. So it's hard to define the timeline, but uh, we are moving forward. Uh, and I, as, as far as myself, I, I couldn't be more committed and more, pa more passionate and energized relative to where we are. I'm committed to make sure that we, I see through a, a very smooth transition to, uh, to my successor, and then I'll continue on as uh, chairman of the board. So that's kind of where we are. We'll keep, we'll keep you up to date as we make progress um, through the year. And, and you know through the remainder of the year and and, uh, and keep you updated. Thank you. And our next question today comes from Steve Tusa with J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Uh, hey, good morning, and good morning. congrats, George. Um, uh, the free cash flow uh, in the quarter was was pretty good. Um, how do you see that playing out uh, in the uh, in the fourth? I know eighty five percent conversion would suggest. I think. Um, Somewhat of a step down in the fourth, um, and you're already on a trailing basis. You look like you're you're already you know very close to 100% conversion. So um, just just curious as to how sustainable uh, you know this this good result is. Oh, great question, Steve. So so you're right. We we saw a really solid improvement year on year, and and the momentum year to date has been has been quite strong. Um, we're seeing um, working capital fundamentals continuously improving and and continue to trending very positively. Uh, the work we've done on, on lowering inventory and improving our SNOP, SNOE process have allowed us to really drive overall more predictability to the working capital. As far as that 85 plus uh, conversion for the year, 
Um, we continue to invest aggressively in parts of the market that are uh, attractive to us, particularly uh, increasing the capacity in our data center as we expand uh, more lines in our, uh, in our factory in North America and, and elsewhere, as well as continue the, the investment in our ERP landscape. Uh, we do believe that the momentum allows us to probably do, do better than 85 um, and structurally and over term we'll be able to uh, continue to improve on that. But uh, as of today, I, I'll tell you 85 plus is, is where we're comfortable. And, and then just as far as the um, guide is concerned um, next year, uh, anything, any, you know, details um, that you can give as far as your strategy, there's obviously going to be a bit of a, of a dislocation uh, moving these things to disk ops with a lag in the uh, capital deployment. Um, how do you plan to, you know, address that on, on earnings? Yeah, we'll, we'll start uh, providing guidance next quarter on continued operation. And you're right, there's going to be a, a little bit of noise, but we are very comfortable that the overall algorithm we've committed to for, for next year uh, will hold true um, as we uh, as we navigate to that continued operation. Um, as you know, some of that residential like commercial business ha had solid cash flow, but the momentum that we see in our core business, thanks to that uh, singular operating model, is really providing strong tailwinds that will allow you to continue to uh, improve on our free cash flow conversion and overall free cash flow performance. Thank you. And our next question today comes from Noah Kay with Oppenheimer. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks. Um, so in, in the release, uh, there's a call out of, uh, of the uh, the gain, the significant gain uh, on uh, some of the insurance recoveries from that AFF settlement. C can you just walk us through, uh, you know, where your expectations are in terms of, you know, actual cash outflows relative to the $750 million, uh settlement that was previously disclosed? Uh, now that you've gotten some some benefit from insurance, and, and maybe talk through the timing of those outflows. Yeah, let me just uh, frame this up here. We we did uh, just going back. We reached a settlement with the plaintiffs relating to the PFAS liability. The um, this settlement obviously resolved a significant amount of our PFAS liability. Just also, you might recall that we announced in July 23 that we're going to discontinue the production of the sale of our fluorinated firefighter fighting foams by June of 2024, which is what we've done. So that's behind us. And, and we we have a significant amount of insurance through more than 20 insurers that is applicable to these claims. And so that's the framework. And, and you've seen that uh, we did re receive 351 from our, our insurers. Um, and maybe Mark, you can talk about as we what we expect going forward. Yeah, so, so from a, a timeline, Noah, we, we took the charge in Q2 for, for $750 million. That's part of the, the settlement. And in the third quarter, we, we, we had receipts from uh, 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 the, the first few um, uh, agreements with our, well, with our insurer of about 351 million. So, so we recovered almost half um, right off the bat, and, and those payments will go back um, um, to the water provider according to our agreement. Um, there's more payments that are going to come um, um, and come in over the next few uh, quarters, and we believe that. Uh, we, we, we're well um, covered from an insurance standpoint, and the net effect overall uh, um, will be the minimus. The timing between recoveries and we see and uh, payments uh, may slip from one quarter to the other, but overall we think we're in good shape there. Thank you. And our next question today comes from Joe Ritchie at Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks, and uh, good morning, everybody. Congratulations, George, on the uh, success of the announcement. Um, Mark, I want to just one quick clarification on the 4Q guide. Uh, is, is, so is discontinued ops out of the 4Q guide? And if so, what is the impact of that? And then going forward into fiscal year 25, how, how should we think about uh, GP margins uh, at this point. I, you guys put up a great number this quarter. Just trying to understand kind of like the puts and takes of, of the moving pieces with uh, with some of the portfolio divestitures. Sure, thanks, Joe. Like, uh, the fourth quarter guide we just gave, it's for the full payment of the company. Uh, we'll start breaking it down at, at the next quarter. So, so, so that guy really holds together um, with the perspective that we are going to continue to see sequential improvement 
both for the business that we have uh, 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 contemplating to divest, as well as the core of our, of our businesses. Now, if you look at the global product margin, and, and if you reflect on the year, um, global product really has benefited from uh, uh, improved uh, processes from an SNOE, SNOP process that, that really drove massive improvement in our, our material handling and our, our, our inventory, and that improved inventory management created massive absorption benefit as well as, as productivity and net-net better conversion costs. That meant that any incremental volume you saw created good leverage and solid leverage um, um, uh, in that business. Now, now that performance in Q3 that we see continuing improving in Q4, um, as you look into 25, we'll go back to a more regular seasonality, right? So you'll see the, the first half of the year um, uh, performance more in the mid-teens given the volume that business sees in the first six months of the year. And then I think we are now uh, uh, very comfortable seeing that business uh, clocking in the 20s in the second half of the year as a natural seasonality and volume ramp up in the second half. Thank you. And our next question today comes from Joe Dio with Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Uh, congrats, George, and, and congrats to, to all of you on the portfolio announcements over the course of the quarter. Um, uh, just curious if you can outline on ADT the the anticipated proceeds as well as any uh, revenue margin kind of EPS related to that exit. And then uh, separately just wanted uh, any clarity on uh, D-stock this year. Uh, the you know what what you saw during the quarter, uh, confidence that you think that's that's behind you, and um, and any sizing of of the overall headwind global products in in 2024 from some of those D-stock pressures. Yeah, let me start with ADT, and and then uh, I'll give some color on D-stock. But George, you, you you can add some more. So that that business. Um, you know, we sign on June 18. We expect to to close uh, the transaction actually this quarter. We've not disclosed the financial terms uh, uh, of the business because it is it is a, a smaller transaction and really not that material. Um, I think what's important to remember is this is really part of our simplification uh, journey. We're really eliminating, I'm sorry, about 30% of our manufacturing footprint, but we're also eliminating a whole series of skew and complexity. This is a very um, commodity business, um, an accessory business, um, and, and it's evolved a lot over the past decade since uh, we acquired that business. Um, but it's, it's an important uh, uh, step in our journey as a pre-pre provider. And the net effect of, of that divestiture after we, uh, we buy back some shares is, is, is uh, immaterial to the overall company. No, on this starting. Uh, yeah. Oops, apologies. Please proceed. Yeah, no. Now, on, on the stocking, um, I, I think we've seen a uh, stock level um, getting back, hopefully, to normalization. Um, there's, there's some pockets of the market that are still uh, uh, um, 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 simplifying a little bit their stock level. But overall, I think that for the most part, um, that large destocking is behind us. And we feel very confident, particularly when uh, product have been uh, uh, refreshed, that we have... Uh, uh, a, a new norm and a new standard on, on our stock levels and, and, and the distribution uh, seems to be holding up pretty good. Yeah, being f very familiar with these businesses, um, when you look at what we've done around, Mark mentioned it uh, as it related to productivity with material planning and the like, and then the work that our team has done really simplifying our SKU base, um, we've done a really nice job now, not only reducing the inventory, but really decreasing our lead times. And so I think we're well positioned now from a from a commercial standpoint to be able to pick up volume because of our short lead times while we're continuing to reduce inventory. So we're back to where we were uh, prior to this ramp up because of all of the disruption in the supply chain. And I feel confident that now on a run rate basis from a growth standpoint, we're starting to see the growth come back and we're doing it, doing it with less inventory. Thank you. And our next question today comes from Jeff Sprague at Vertical Research. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. And George, good luck on whatever's next. Um, just want to come back uh, to the portfolio changes. Um, you know, obviously, you're not going to report 
Q4 or 2024 on the basis with which you guided, given things going to disc ops. So, so maybe you could just actually share with us, given where your guidance stands today uh, and what you're doing on stranded and other costs, uh, what the reset 2024 base looks like on an equivalent basis relative to your current guide. Uh, and then when you do have the proceeds to de deploy, should we expect you to kind of solve to your same leverage uh, ratios that we see today, kind of split between share repurchase and debt reduction to kind of maintain the same leverage, or will you do something different with, uh, you know, how you structure the balance sheet? Thank you. Yeah, got you, Jeff. So on, on, on these cups, um this is not changing um, any of our commitment and is actually, um, we feel very comfortable with where we've guided from the full portfolio and as well as where we think uh, the continued operating business will go. As far as the, uh, um, um, the, the use of proceed and, and what we plan on doing, um, so, so we expect the transaction to close in, in the next 12 months. Um, and we plan to return most of the, the net proceeds to shareholder uh, through a, a share repurchase uh, um, program, very similarly to what we did a few years ago when we divested our, our battery power solutions business. As far as um, addressing our leverage, um, it will very much depend on the timing of the closing. Um, we, we're thinking 12 months, but it could go three months either way. Um, and so we could easily uh, see ourselves growing into our existing um, debt level and, and not have to redeploy uh, much, or we could see ourselves in the transaction close much, much quicker than we anticipating, having to address uh, uh, some leverage uh, at that point. Our goal is to uh, remain committed um, to our uh, investment grade uh, rating, and we'll work with the agency depending on the timeline as to what's most appropriate to be able to meet that commitment. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. And our next question today comes from Andy Kapowitz of Citigroup. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. George, congratulations. Thanks, Andy. Could you update us on what you're thinking regarding the ability to start growing backlog and earnings in Asia PAC and, and what your expectations are for Q4 bookings and backlogs? Backlog was up slightly sequentially in Q3, and I know you've talked about expecting a bigger uptick by the end of the year while telling us today that China's still muted. So do you still see bookings beginning to accelerate in Q4, and do you still see recovery in that region in FY25? Now, great question, and, and, and you partially answer it. Yeah, yeah, we continue to see sequential improvement. There, there, there is a slower recovery than we had uh, initially anticipated. Um, so one of the reasons we, we, we tightened the, uh, the, the guide for the year and, and, and why you see a, a revenue growth a, a little lower than we ex, uh, anticipated. But that momentum uh, is continued to build, um, and, and the other intake we saw in Q3 was um, um, sequentially a, a good improvement from Q2, and we see that sequential improvement continue in Q4. Um, you know, while we expect um, one more challenging quarter in the fourth quarter here, we're still probably declining revenue year on year in, in, in the low single digit. Um, that of the momentum is going to turn positive, um, positioning as well as we enter 2025. So we absolutely see that business recovering in 2025, particularly on a year-on-year -year compare. The, the, the comps are going to become easier given the challenging year we just went through. Um, the backlog, as you mentioned, has been sequentially improving over the last few quarters, and we continue to redeploy the resource in this most attractive part of the market, but we continue to remain very disciplined in the type of job and the counterparty uh, we deal with in the market in China as that market continues to be pretty challenged. Thank you. And our next question comes from Andrew Oben with Bank of America. Please go ahead. Hi, yes, good morning. And George, congratulations. Andrew. Uh, just a question, uh, just maybe a little bit more detail. You highlighted more disciplined approach in EMEA uh, systems. Um, what did you do 
And, uh, you know, what's your ability to apply this approach elsewhere in the portfolio? No, great question. So um, the, the discipline um, that we've put in place is really part of our overall operating model. And that operating model really started as we um, refined it in North America a couple of years back. And you can see North America really benefiting from that discipline over time and, and that focus. Uh, th there's really two things that are happening. Um, we um, centralize more the decision making process as which vertical and uh, which market we really approach. And we really refocus that, organ that commercial organization towards those parts of the market where we see a very mo much uh, attractive margin as we can sell value and we have customers uh, that are interested in our product and see value over life cycle, but also parts of the market where you see a stronger service attached. And when you do that, you're able to actually drive a modest growth in the system business but a much larger growth in our service business as that service attached yields better outcome overall. So we, that, that's, that, that, that operating system has been really fully deployed in, in North America. That's probably where the maturity is at the highest. Emila is still going through that. Um, I, I, I see uh, Emila closing the gap uh, with its regional peers. Um, Asia had a strong operating model. I think the market moved on us very fast and then we are repivoting as quick as we can but you'll see you'll see as i mentioned on, on the prior question you'll see uh, apac uh, repivoting very quickly and that operating model maturing across the board outside of north america including in emilia thank you and our next question today comes from dean dre at rbc capital markets please go ahead thank you good morning everyone and add my congrats to george thanks dean Hey, uh, I don't think you've given much detail here, but could you share us with any of the economics of the uh, uh, divestiture of air distribution technologies? Yeah, as I mentioned, Dean, uh, while this is a critical step in our simplification journey, um, the, the, the financial terms are not disclosed because they're really, it's really a smaller transaction and not very material for the overall uh, value of the enterprise. We, 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 we struck a, what we feel is a very attractive deal for, uh, for, for, for the enterprise with trolling capital. Uh, we're hoping to close that business very, very quickly and hopefully within, uh, within the next few weeks. Got it. Thank you. And then second question, George, there's been uh, a lot of interest in your peers regarding uh, not just data center, but liquid cooling technologies in data center. You've seen that your peers make direct investments in technologies, businesses. Um, is this something that uh, you all are looking at as well? You've got certainly components that are part of these technologies, but uh, there's a, a, a big developing opportunity, high growth, and it seemed like it would be a good fit. Absolutely. Um, we're in incred incredibly well positioned with all of our hyperscaler and Colos uh, customers. And from an R&D standpoint, understanding what their next generation is, how do we leverage our, you know, what we would say is a leadership portfolio with a lot of IP. And then as we go to liquid cooling, you know, with the um, cooling distribution unit um, at the end of, it's still going to require a lot of the cooling technology that we deploy, but making sure that we're going to be positioned um, either either producing those units and or partnering to make sure that we have the full solution and how we position with our with our hyperscalers and colos. And so I, you know, we see this playing out as an uh, incredible opportunity for us and one that we've been investing in not only in our core technology, but our our application of that technology with with overall liquid cooling. Thank you. And our next question today comes from Gautam Khanna with TD Cowan. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks. Good morning and uh, congrats, George. Thanks. Morning, Gautam. I wanted to ask on that CEO search, you know, what, George, from your perspective, like what kind of attributes are you looking for from whoever uh, succeeds you? What do you think they need to, to bring? Well, I mean, as, as we think about the company and the simplification of the company, it's important that we, we bring a lot of, lot of um, 
domain expertise and industrial expertise. Uh, we're a company that is a product technology company. We're a service company and how we deploy that technology. Um, certainly we're solutions in, in how we actually go to market. So there's a lot of experiences there that we'd be, be looking for uh, to complement. Um, you know, as we did the, the board refreshment um, with, with Patrick, just uh, to, to talk that a, a little bit, you know, we are constantly looking for qualified board candidates in how we, you know, think about refresh and succession. And Patrick is a, is a fantastic addition, you know, a, a world-class executive with experience transforming Xylem and similar experience going from an industrial products company into an advanced technology service solution enterprise. So as we think about you know, CEO uh, succession and the like, obviously strong operating experience, strong domain ex experience, and the ability to be able to take um, the incredible foundation that we've built here to the next level, um, uh, leading the new new Johnson Controls. Thank you. And our next question today comes from Nicole DeBlaze with Butcher Bank. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Good morning, guys. And I'll add my congrats to George on the announcement today. Um, just wanted to ask about orders. So you guys mentioned, you know, lumpiness around data center maybe contributing to the 5% organic growth this quarter. I guess, um, how do you think about the potential opportunity for order acceleration from here based on what you're seeing in the pipeline today as we try to calibrate expectations for the next few quarters? Thanks. As you know, we, we, we try to shy away from, from providing guidance on all those, but, but what I can tell you is you're absolutely right. We see lumpiness in, in the orders, uh, particularly coming from the data center vertical. That, that also means that there's going to be a quarter where, where you're going to see very large order, and, 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 and we continue to see an increased pipeline in that particular vertical. Uh, that gives us confidence that you will see a, a, a pretty large order quarters. Uh, uh, over the next few few coming quarters. This particular quarter, we have a tough compare year on year. We had very solid orders, particularly in the data center vertical uh, in the third quarter of last year. But again, that pipeline remains healthy um, and, and that lumpiness will, uh, will probably not go away anytime soon. And I think just to add on to that, when you look at the value proposition that we bring to data centers with our, our portfolio multi-technologies, um, and the way that we've been building out capacity to be able to serve our customers as, as they achieve their growth, um, these become multi-year agreements. And so as we're positioning, you can get very large orders multi-year. Um, and that's what we're seeing um, as we're partnering and making sure that we're positioned to get more than our fair share, um, bringing our technologies and capabilities with the full solution to our customers globally. Thank you. And our final question today comes from Brett Lins with Mizuho. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning and congrats to George. Um, just wanted to come back to the fourth quarter guide. So the 19% EBITDA margin, wanted to understand your level of visibility there. Is this something uh, that you're converting out of backlog and you have line of sight to? Just, just any color towards that 60% incremental margin. Yeah, you know, we absolutely have strong visibility to it. And, and if you look um, year on year, um, for sure that 19% looks uh, pretty um, heavy with uh, 250 to 300 basis points year on year improvement. But now if you look at it sequentially, uh, when we went from Q2 to Q3 and Q3 to Q4, um, jumping from uh, almost 18% to 19% is, is absolutely part of that sequential run rate. The same fundamental we've saw but from Q2 to Q3, having a strong backlog, having really a book to build business, both in the field and at global product, continuing to driving more volume. And the comments I've made on global products and the incredible work that's been done there to take care of the base cost and conversion costs, allowing us to really drive a lot of bottom line benefit for a small volume increment gives us very strong confidence that we can, uh, that we can achieve that margin rate in the fourth quarter. Thank you. And this concludes our question and answer session. I'd like to turn the conference back over to George Oliver for any closing remarks. Now, thank you, operator. And I'd like to, to thank the entire Johns Controls team for their incredibly hard work and dedication in getting us to where we are today. Our transformation into a pure play provider of comprehensive solutions for com commercial buildings is substantially complete. And 
we're well positioned to now deliver long-term sustainable value for our shareholders as a simpler, higher growth company. We know we're on the right path as our strategy is already delivering results and we are looking forward to this next chapter for our company. I am proud of the, the growth Johnson Controls has been able to achieve and couldn't be more excited about where we go next. So with that operator, that concludes our call today. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. We thank you all for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect your lines and have a wonderful rest of the day.